Hey, I'm Jimmy Ellis, and I'm the pastor here at Noonan City Church. I want to thank you. You'll find as you walk through that we focus on three areas primarily. One is worship, small groups, and local missions. And our purpose is transforming lives for Jesus' sake, helping individuals experience that transformation. And we use these three areas, worship, small groups, and local missions, to help individuals experience that. You'll get a sense of of who Noonan City Church is, and I hope that you'll come and worship with us soon. Take care, and God bless. The views and opinions expressed during this broadcast do not necessarily reflect the beliefs of this radio station, its management, or its sponsors. Listeners are urged to use their own discernment to draw their own conclusions. It's now time for Faith Works with Pastor Jimmy Ellison from Noonan City Church. Good morning, Noonan. You're listening to Faith Works. I'm Jimmy Ellison, and Each week, we interview leaders here in Coweta County who are showing that faith does indeed work. And I'm thrilled this morning to have my friend Hank Arnold, who is the executive director of Coweta Force here. And we'll learn more about that as the show goes on. But Hank, man, I'm so glad that you're with us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you asking me on. Well, you, when I first met you, probably, we met, what, five months ago, maybe, something like that? Something like that. And I remember meeting you, Hank, and thinking, all right, this is somebody I want to get to know better. And I'm thrilled that, um, that we can hear more of your story. So just start us off. Tell us, tell us about Hank Arnold. Did you grow up here in Georgia and your family? How did you, how, tell us a little about your upbringing. Yeah, so um, I'm 40 years old, um, and I was raised a little bit east of, east of here, born and raised in a small town called Griffin, Georgia. Griffin Bears. Yep. Did, Griffin, you, go, did you go to Griffin High I School? I did. I went to Griffin High School. At that time, there was only one high school when okay. I was in high school. Now they have two. Yes. Um, but yeah, Griffin Bears, uh, class of 1997. Um, born and raised there. Um, my family's from there. Um, you know. Um, were you born in the church? Were, I mean, were you raised in the church? So yeah, I was raised in the church, and um, my grandfather was a- actually an interim pastor. Really? Yeah, he was an interim pastor around the Griffin area, and uh, faith was something that he had. You know, he he gotten really involved after you know we all sort of run up against I think we all sort of run up against some self will and some self reliance and experience some sort of unmanageability and, and through that experience we get to come back around to what's real mm-hmm. um, and sort of lean in on our faith and start that journey and that's essentially what he did but you know he worked full time and he um, he drove trucks and he did other other jobs but he always had a passion for the ministry mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know um and so i was definitely raised in a church um actually the church that i remember the most was griffin first assembly oh really the, the big church over there well right? yeah but, but the, the the where i remember it from is its old location which is which is um not the new Kroger, but the old Kroger in in Griffin is okay. where the original First Assembly of God was at. Really, I had no idea. Yeah. I, I've only done you know the air, yep. the big one on ninety two, yeah. that location. Yeah, so where, where Hobby Lobby is located, like across from IHOP, is mm-hmm. where that campus used to be before they leveled it and built that shopping center. So that's wow. really where I remember it from. Wow. So you grew up grew up in the church there. Did you go off to after high school? Did you go off to college? Well, the other piece that I haven't entered introduced as of yet is that I'm I'm also a person in long-term recovery and what that means for me is I haven't had a drink or a drug uh, in almost nine years oh, wow which is a huge huge accomplishment for me um, and I, and I never had the opportunity like the path that I was on didn't allow me the opportunity to take advantage of just some of the natural things that most children most adolescents encounter did you start using at a young age i started using at a very early age and what i'm always curious what what do you think is the one or two factors that get someone using at a young age what 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 is what is what's the why why do some kids find themselves using and others don't well you know 
the, the more work that I do around this topic, you know, and, and, and I have parents and I have people ask me all the time, what's the one thing, you know, and I don't think it's one thing, and it's so individualized because I see, okay. I see kids that come from a, a very poor upbringing with, with, with not much of a, a great influences in their life that turn out to use, but then I also see people from affluent families that had everything in life yeah. and had all the right upbringing that, that turn around and use also, um, mm-hmm. and so I don't know that it's one thing and I, I can really speak for myself um, you know and you know a lot of it for me or very early on was um, just quite honestly I just didn't feel good about I didn't feel good being in Hank's skin you know yeah I didn't feel good about being in Hank's skin and I don't think it was I don't I don't know you know there's was a it, lot of it that's still a mi- it's sort of sort of is a mystery sure was it um did you find it easy to find? Did you start with alcohol and then did that move into yeah, drugs? Yeah, yeah. Start with alcohol, it? moved into marijuana pretty quickly. Those two kind of go hand in hand. And, you know, I wouldn't say that just because it, kids experiment with alcohol or marijuana, they turn to harder drugs. But I can tell you, every kid that has turned to harder drugs always started with, right. typically started with yeah. alcohol and marijuana. Yeah. That sort of is, is the That's the been stark. my experience sure. as, as well. So you... What can you mind sharing? What age you got started? So I mean, I first started experimenting with alcohol. I think my first drink was like at twelve years old. You know, wow. and it wasn't like I was whoa, full blown, right? Sure, full blown into addiction at twelve. But that was my first experience. Um, and most of the kids in the neighborhood were older than me, and you know, it was like you know, beer that was in the refrigerator in the workshop of the guy's house across the street from me. Yeah. His dad's, you know, alcohol. Yeah. Um, or uh, you know, an open bar at a friend's uh, at, at a friend of mine's you know bar basement that his his parents would host you know gatherings you yeah. know, um, and you know I come from I come from a, a family of uh, of alcoholics. My dad was an alcoholic. His dad was an alcoholic. A lot, and some unmanageability there. But then there was also a lot of success in that family as well. And mm-hmm. so they did a really good job of getting up and going to work, being mm-hmm. hard workers, raising kids, you know, being uh, pillars in the community and sort of having a reputation to uphold. But then some unmanageability around around alcoholism behind closed doors. They were able doors. to function sure. in the midst of all of that. Sure. What, do you buy into the whole alcoholic gene you hear people talk about? I think, you know, just just going off research and studies, because there's a lot of research on this, you know, and basically what you're looking at from a, from a male, from a, a dad to a son, the, the chances are, I mean, just statistics show that your chances of becoming addicted increase if you're a parent, especially from father to son. So I, I feel like that, that can be a part of it, but I don't think that's all of it. Yeah. You know, there's so much more that goes into that. Yeah. You know, you have social environments, you have interpersonal stuff, you have relationships, you have, there's so much that goes into individuals not only making a choice to experiment, but they, then to continue along that path until like the addiction sets in, yeah. you know? So you started at a young age. You, you got clean at 31. I got clean at 32. 32. 32. 32 years old, yep. And so that means that you spent, what, a good 15 years? 15, 18 uh, you, years. Pretty heavy years yeah, in? Yeah, you know, I was in, I was in, I was in treatment at 15 years old. Wow. Yeah. Wow, your parents got you. Well... It, the, the judicial system got me. Judicial system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they have a way of you know um, of. So how long did you go away for that? Did you? Um, I was doing outpatient services as an adolescent at 15 years old, where I was at home, but I was going every day, Monday through Friday, and I attended what? school yeah, there. I was going to ask yeah. you. So they they did you get a the diploma or GED through them? Well, or? I attended school there, but still I was at home, and I so I still had access, and I could go periods of time with absence. But, you know, I also think about the age of 15 years old. You're trying to explain to somebody that their life is unmanageable, and they just don't know. They're just not really buying into that. Sure, sure. Even though sort of the writing's on the wall, and it it is what it is, but at at an adolescent, and the way that, I don't know, I think about the concept that I had of my consequences and choices at 15 years old just weren't that great, like most 15-year-olds. Sure, sure. So you were in and out of rehab starting at 15? I was in, in and out of... 
I was in rehab and in treatment at 15 years old um, through uh, a community service board called McIntosh Trail. And I remember going to that program and being in with other, uh, other adolescents, right? And it was both male and female. And we probably had upwards of 10 to 13 folks at a time. And they served a five-county area. And so they would send a bus around. And they would pick us up from our house and take us back home. And I remember, man, I remember some of the counselors there that really, I mean, to work with that, uh, that population takes a special person. Sure. And, and how long did this last? Uh, I was in that setting for about nine months. Okay. Um, and, and I eventually, uh, I eventually was, was discharged from the program uh, incomplete. Just because uh, you know, I continue. You know, it wasn't always consistent, but I, I was failed uh, drug screens, and my attitude get real poor, and then I would just really sabotage mm. all of my yeah. all of my growth. Yeah. You know, um, and so it became really easy to sort of give up. You know, and so they they uh, eventually they gave me a lot of chances, and they really believed in me. What were your parents doing at this time? How were they speaking life into you and encouraging you? And I know you're making them pull their hair out, I'm sure. Right, right. Well, my dad actually passed away um, when I was six years old mm. from a single car accident. Mm. And um, so my mom actually, she was working at Carter's Mill in Barnesville. And it was a, a, a meal that made baby clothes. And so she was working there, and she was going to school at Gordon College to get a degree. And so she did. She finished school, she got a degree, and she went to work for the state. And so um, it was uh, myself, and I got a younger sister, 14 months younger than me, and I got an older sister, six, year, six years older than me. And so she was at work. You know, she would get up and leave the house. She would be gone by 7 o'clock. And she'd get home around 5.30 or 6. I had a lot of unsupervised time. Yeah. You know, I had a lot of unsupervised time. My grandparents were in the picture, and uh, I had aunts and uncles that were in the picture. But, you know, life was rolling on for everybody. And, you know, um, I had a great family, you know. Mm. I had a really good family, really good uh, system, support system. And I, I had people that believed in me. Yeah, yeah. You know? Wow. So you, um, so did you go off to college after this season? Well, so I ended up, and I know a lot of this information you're hearing for the first time. And yeah, so, it is. I, yeah, a lot I of this okay that I'm asking. Yeah, this. it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Um, and so I found myself after after um, being discharged from treatment, um, incomplete. I ended up uh, catching a charge in the midst of my addiction, and I ended up in juvenile detention. So I was in juvenile detention. Seventeen at this time. I was. Uh, I was sixteen. Sixteen. I was 16 at this time, and so it was right around the time the, the law, sometime somewhere around, and this was in the in the early 90s, um, and the law had shifted from um, you can go to the, the the county jail at 17 years old, and so just before my 17th birthday, my probation officer cut me loose and said, "Look, you're about to be 17 years old. There's a place right next door. If you don't learn to." live your life differently, you're going to be next door. Yeah. And I remember thinking, this lady doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> so how'd that work out for you? Yeah. yeah and you, you pretty much guess, you know, within probably six months of being 17 or less, I was in the county jail. Mm. Spalding County Jail. 401 Justice Boulevard is, the, is that address. How long did you stay? Uh, mm. You know, my... my this was the deal, too. And my mom had, had been through some of this unmanageability and some of this insanity with my dad as a heavy drinker. And, uh, you know, parts of this, man, I look back on it. My dad was a great guy when he was sober. You know, he just, mm. he really was. Mm. You know, um, but those times got to be less and less, you know. And, and part of what she would say, and, and, it, and I used to, I couldn't stand it. But when I would be impaired, she would look me in the eye and she said, you remind me of your dad. And that was really, you know, really kind of the person I didn't want to be. You know, as good a guy as he was and all that, um, that was really kind of the person I had prided myself on. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I really just don't want to do and make those choices. Yeah. You know, um, there's a lot of pain behind growing up in an alcoholic family. I'm you know? sure. I'm sure. Um, so, um, you know, I, I stayed. So I was old enough to go to the county jail. But the only person that could bond me out because I was 17 was my parent or legal guardian. 
And I needed $97 to make bond. And she did not come get me out. And how long? You stayed in there how long? Five, six months. I mean, until I went wow. to court. Wow. You talk about until I, went to, lie, until I went to court, you know, and I was wow. making some really high-risk decisions. And at the time, I just couldn't believe that she wouldn't come get me out, mm. you know. But also, I didn't really have a plan to do anything different, you know. Um, so four or five months until I went to court. And I got out and had 12 months probation. And part of the deal with being on probation is that you have enough contact with a surveillance officer is that if you're not doing what you need to do, it's just real easy to go back. You know, and that's, that's pretty much, I rocked on with that for a, for a while. You know, I ended up at a probation boot camp out in Edenton, Georgia. And then um, shortly thereafter, I'd violated my probation again and called another charge. And uh, I ended so when up you, when you got when you were arrested, were you drinking and driving? Were you intoxicated in public? So my or? crimes basically consisted of, you know, illegal activity to obtain to to obtain drugs. So not violence. You're not robbing. You're not. Yeah. You're not robbing no. anything. You're just you're partaking. You're you're taking drugs. And that's right. Anything harder than marijuana? Oh yeah. Yeah, I pretty much was an equal opportunity user by this time, you know. I was I was pretty much an equal opportunity user. Um, and, and you know, I, um, you know, at the end of the day, anything that made me feel better or different or but also too the the buy-in for me was the lifestyle too because there was a fun, there was an appealing lifestyle to it and so i was also addicted to everything that went along with the yeah. lifestyle yeah you know and fast, those are the fast things, living yeah fast living and you know i was i was actually able to be i was actually able to recreate myself you know into something that i wasn't but i never really knew who i was you know getting getting down to the heart issue of getting okay with who i am yeah. knowing my assets my liabilities knowing what i want to be when i grow up you know and just sort of digging into those family values that i was raised with and you know all the opportunity that i had I, you know i was able to to walk away from that mm -hmm. you know and 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 i'd never really understood what that was anyway but by this point you know i was really invested in what i was doing you know, 17, 18 years old, and I'm making these choices. And How you know, are you getting money? What are, you, are you working somewhere? So, you know, I had, I had some jobs from time to time, and, you know, I was a really good employee. And, I, you know, I could hold it together for some okay. time. You know, when I had consequences, I could hold it together for some time, and then the, once I would start using, the wheels would fall off. Yeah. You know, I, I just couldn't. I didn't have the ability to maintain any kind of uh, integrity and any kind of, like, standards of living or just really sort of the guidelines that people sort of have in their lives when I'm when I'm using drugs and the harder the drugs I'm using the less judgment I'm utilizing you know right and it just sort of, sort of gets to be really off the rails and crazy so you you live this life so you had a decade of this 20 to 32 mm -hmm. what um or 30 yeah 32 mm -hmm. what what was that decade like? Well, I'll tell you. As I got older, you know, I did ended, you marry any? Did you yeah, get married? Yeah. In the so I ended this? up. I ended up. I ended up having a son at 21 years old. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna tell you, he he really did a lot to change my perspective. Uh, he slowed me down a whole lot, you know. Um, and I was a I was a really good dad. You know, that was a really cool thing to show up. And I really wanted to be the dad that I never had, you know. Um, and so that was a big focus. Um, now, his, his mother and I never married, mm -hmm. but, um, but we were together for about three years before, obviously. And it's, this is the other piece to the, to the addiction. Is as much as I want my life to improve and as much as I want things to be different, I just didn't have the tools or the skills. Mm. You know, and I also didn't have the willingness to, to follow some direction. You know, I was just sort of making my own way. Uh, I was working. I was doing. Uh, that's when I got into doing underground utilities. I operated heavy equipment. Um, started out on a meter installation crew on a water line, and I, I would always start at the bottom of these jobs, and I would work my way up. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'd be in supervisor positions, and I would I would be quick to get pay increases, and so I could, and I was good at it. I was really good at operating equipment. I was a hard worker. And also with that lifestyle just for the companies that I worked for, I was able to sort of continue to do some of the things that I was doing as far as, as, far as the usage, but I would go to work. 
Mm-hmm. You know, um, and so after having my, my first child, it slowed me down a lot. After three years, his mother and I separated, um, continuing to, to, to use, and it just, you know, it just makes things unmanageable. I can't be a good partner. I can't show up and be anything consistently. As much as I yeah. want to do these things, I yeah. just don't have the ability to when I'm using. Yeah. You know? So how did you stop? So I mean, I'm always fascinated right. with at this right. the turning point, right. the change. Right. And so in, in 2002, um, so part of what, one of the pieces is I was mandated to one of the first accountability courts, the first accountability and court. what does that mean? Accountability court uh, is really through, it's, it's alternative sentencing okay. through the, uh, through the um, correct, Department of Corrections. So instead of, if I catch a drug charge or some drug-related charge and my issue, I'm not really a criminal, but I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in a criminal activity due to my addiction, they, they sort of monitor my behavior give me random drug screens and I have accountability and touch points throughout the week where I have to attend certain uh, education classes and certain there's certain things that I have to do certain criteria and this is an alternative to like going to jail or prison you know because that that doesn't really cure this thing you know Um, and so I was I was court ordered to the first accountability court in the state of Georgia now the guy that was over that accountability court was Bill Larkey do you know Bill Larkey I don't Bill Larkey is a member of Sunrise Church okay uh, he lives here in Coweta County uh, is he, does he run the um, celebrate he does okay he's the he's the yep, he's the yes. lead and so Bill Larkey was entrusted with uh, the first accountability court in the state of Georgia, sort of a pilot program before it was drug really? court or daily report. I'm ashamed to tell you, Bill's been on the show before. You know, he, he came, I don't know how many months ago, but I, yes, I'm sorry. So he was over that. So he yeah. was essentially, he was my probation officer supervisor. Yeah. Right. And, and there's more to come about this. Bill, Bill Larkey is now a board member of Coweta Force. Okay. Great. That's a cool thing. Yeah, right. And we'll is. get into that a little yeah. bit later about how it's come full circle. But, you know, Bill Larkey was over that. Um, and I was court ordered to that and through that process of being court ordered to that they, it was mandatory that I go to uh, not only show up I had to go you know depending upon which phase you're in pretty much every day for the first phase and then phase two is when you're really looking at getting a job paying your fine you have less touch points so you go from five days a week to three days a week and then you you, you get on up and you graduate but um, I was court ordered and I finally got around to completing I was court ordered in 1997. It was a six month program. Um, and then I finally got around to complete an accountability court, graduating from it in 2002. So you can do the math on how long it took me to abstain. So, so during that time period, you were using some and still not quite. I struggled with changing my life. Yeah. So how, what, what, but what made the difference? What, when, when did you wake up and say, I am no longer going to take a drug or a drink? You know, yeah, I, don't, I don't know that I ever felt that strongly about it on day one. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you, in 2002, I'd had, uh, I, I, I had completed the accountability court, and I had been four months off of supervision. I had 10 years probation at one time. Ten years. Ten years. Ten years. And so I'd completed I had completed accountability court and so I had less touch points. And even after completing accountability court, I continued to use. Mm. And I'd had some, some more legal issues and I'd had some involvement on um on 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 custody of my children because I'm I'm unable to provide a fit home if yeah. I'm if I'm using. You sure. Know? And sure. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the problem on this, but this is the backstory. This is this no. is my experience, and sure. this is just sort of what I lived through, you know. Um, but I'll tell you what, in 2002, I'd had enough touch points because it was mandatory that I go to community support group meetings, right? And so that could be 12 step, that could be celebrate recovery, that could be some form of community support around addiction, mm-hmm. right? And they I, had you had to attend I, one I a week. Had to, I had to attend four a week. For a week, and they were serious, man. They, I mean, they would compare signatures, and so there was a lot of times that you know, if you weren't being on the up and up, and you were, you know, signing in a signature, and you, they would eventually come back and, and figure it out. So I was, I would begrudgingly go, but after a while, I started hearing some stuff. 
I started identifying with some folks in there, and I started to create some relationships with folks in there. And, I, and I, so that was sort of a foundation for community support groups. And then I got off of supervision. I quit going to community support groups. But at 32 years old, I'll tell you, man, I'd had some really bad experiences in 2009, right? The last, time, the last day I used it. 2009. 2009. The la but I'll tell you, the last time I had a drink or a drug was on January the 10th, 2010. But two, I'll tell you, um, and, I was, and I was married at the time, um, and my wife said, let's just go to church somewhere. And I just wasn't interested in going to church. Mm. And she was on me, on me, and she said, let's just go to church somewhere. And, and, and I said, okay, we'll, we'll go. We'll go. And this was in September 2009. And she said, well, where do you want to go? I said, I have no idea. You pick it. She said, well, I would really like for you to do a little research and figure out where you want to go. And so I picked Rock Springs Church, Dr. Benny Tate out in Milner, Georgia. Sure. And I was living in Griffin at the time. And so I went. And I'll tell you, man, it was a powerful experience. Sure. I, I don't remember what was said. <laughs> right. I got no idea what was said, but I knew, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a part of a... I'm, I'm a part of a, a small community-based church here in Coweta County, and, we, you know, we just don't do altar calls, which is fine, but they did an altar call. And my head said, don't go, don't go, but my feet went. You know, do you know what I'm saying? I know exactly what and, <laughs> and I could no longer, for, and for some reason, and it wasn't a white light deal, that wasn't the deal, but what, what, what happened for me in September 2009 was I could no longer deny the truth about the way I was living my life, mm, right? I just good. came face to face with the truth, and, it, and as ugly as it was, I was able to see it for what it was, wow. you know? Wow. And, and, and on one hand, that's, that's great, and on the other hand, it's yeah. real depressing, right? And my dad died. Yeah, it's a reality. It's a reality check. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And my dad died at 33, and I was 32, and I knew I was going to die. Mm. I knew I was going to leave my kids just like my dad left. I knew it was coming. Mm. My, 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 my addiction, my, my use had gotten more and more yeah. progressive. And I had a more and more high-risk behavior. Mm. had more... Tristan. Sounds like it was a Holy Spirit moment sure. that turned Absolutely. things around. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I didn't... That wasn't the end of my using. It was just a part. Okay. Right? right. That was September 2009. I'll use my last drink and drug in January 2010. So right. there was another, another four, four and a half months. Wow. Well, Hank, we're, we're coming up on our hard break. Um, we got the got a fire truck running down downtown Noonan here. We are coming up on a hard break, Hank. When we get back, I, we've got to hear about Coweta Force. Sure. Because it sounds like God has prepared you Absolutely. for this season that you're in currently in your life. Want to hear about that. Want to hear about some life change, mm -hmm. life changes, that um, stories of individuals who have been impacted by Coweta Force. Friends, you're listening to Faith Works. We'll be right back. Wildwood Trader at 15 Greenville Street in Noonan is your home for hand-built antique furniture, cabinets, and more. Fun decorating items. And, of course, at Wildwood Trader... Direct from the factory items and furniture. So you get 20% below the factory and store prices. Call 770-683-4304. Open Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sundays, 12 noon to 5 p.m. Wildwood Trader, your home decorating specialist in Newman. Ever dreamed of being a radio DJ or hosting your own show? Now here's your chance. WQEE 99 Rock the Key is giving you an opportunity to host your own own show. If you'd like to get your advertising message across the thousands of listeners throughout the area, here's your chance. Hosting your own show is the way to do it. Perfect for attorneys, realtors, churches, sports talk shows, and more. Contact 678-673-6318 for further information. Host your own show. Join us here live from Noonan, Georgia, as we present the Health, Happiness, and Harmony Hour, every Wednesday from 10 to 11. I'm your host, Dr. Lewis Boynton. Please join us each week as we have new guests and talk about topics related to the psychological world. We're hoping that you will find interesting and helpful topics that will help you have more health, happiness, and harmony in your life. Join us every Wednesday from 10 to 11 at 99.1 WQEE Rock and Roll 
Radio. Tune in the second and fourth Thursday each month for Know Your Rights. I'm your host, Charles Cobble, and we'll discuss your rights and have plenty of information on what those rights are every second and fourth Thursday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. on WQEE 99.1 FM. Hey, I'm Jimmy Ellis, and I'm the pastor here at Noonan City Church. I want to thank you. You'll find as you walk through that we focus on three areas primarily. One is worship, small groups, and local missions. And our purpose is transforming lives for Jesus' sake, helping individuals experience that transformation. And we use these three areas, worship, small groups, and local missions, to help individuals experience that. You'll get a sense of of who Noonan City Church is, and I hope that you'll come and worship with us soon. Take care, and God bless. Welcome back to Faith Works. I'm Jimmy Ellison. I'm your host. We are talking to Hank Arnold, who is the executive director of Coweta Force. And Hank, thank you so much for sharing so much of your of the background that led you to this season that mm-hmm. you're currently in. Um, when did you? When did the Lord give you the idea of Coweta Force? When When did that pop in your head? You know, I, I think about two. You know. I already said, you know, my last day using was in January of 2010, and none of this came overnight. None of it came overnight. I was still doing operating heavy equipment and doing uh, construction management when I found recovery. Um, and, you know, th- what I found out through that process is that um, the only person that changes when I find recovery is, is me. Mm. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And a lot of my life changed, you know. Um, I walked in at just after celebrating two years of recovery and my wife at the time said i don't know you anymore wow i I want a divorce you know and and i wasn't prepared for that you know i wasn't i wasn't prepared but i tell you i'd done enough work in the first year of my recovery um and i and i'd seen god work enough in my recovery that, that, that I knew I was going to be okay. And that was really probably the first time I faced anything hard and didn't completely self-destruct. And what I found out on the... There was a, there was a lot of freedom for me on the other side of that, right? I dug into some things that I hadn't been willing to dig into. Um, I didn't graduate high school. I would have been class of 1997 for Griffin High. Yeah. And, and I made a decision to go back to school and get a GED. And I, I know that sounds, might not sound like a big deal, but for me that was a big deal. No, the I, last time so. I'd sat in a classroom was ninth grade. Yeah. Right? Wow. And, and so I was able to go back and do some things, and I had some mentors in my life that encouraged me to continue to stay on the path to go back to school. And I was taking recovery meetings in to Henry County Jail and to Anchor Hospital. So you were leading the recovery groups? Right. Wow. Right. And so I was going to Anchor Hospital. I've been a patient there three times. Yeah. Henry County Jail. I've been a resident there a couple of times. <laughs> and it was really cool. Let me tell you, it was really cool to walk in those down the down in that eight in that pod and do a recovery meeting. It was really cool to walk back on that unit and do a recovery meeting and walk out after an hour. Yeah. I had a lot of gratitude, you know, and so I really liked working with people in recovery and I never really thought you know, at this time, I'm gaining self-respect. I'm gaining self-esteem. I'm gaining yeah. the things back that I'd never really obtained. There are certain yeah. natural courses of life that, 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 you know, just most people gather naturally. And a lot of those times, I didn't have, mm. right? And so here I am in my early 30s, and I'm just now experiencing what, you know, some people just learn in their early 20s naturally. Sure, you sure. Know? So you... When, when did you birth Coweta Force? Well, it started out as a volunteer, so... And I've got to say this, too. You know, as I did that, um, I, I got into the addiction recovery field, right? And so I worked for Talbot Recovery Campus on the south side of Atlanta. They hired me just before my second year anniversary. Really? They hired me entry-level position. I worked with the young adults at the residences, and I was working there while I was going back to school to get a certification in addictions counseling. And as I got certified there, I got, a, I got, a, uh, I got an increase uh, in, in pay and a promotion into the intake department. And then from there, it just sort of followed the traje- trajectory. And I was in there uh, for about three years. That's where I was at as a resident assistant, as well as in the intake department. And then after about three years, I got another promotion as to uh, 
program coordinator and I, and I would assist in managing our transitional programs. And so they helped raise me in this process also. The whole time I'm, I, I'm still focusing on my recovery because that sort of mission for me to help other people can't be the source that keeps me well. I right. still have to continue to be vigilant about the things that I got to do, right? And so that, that hasn't been the... Th Certainly, it's a part of, I would never be in this arena if it weren't for my own personal recovery, but that, I still have to do the things that keep me well. Because yeah. you can't pour from an empty cup, and there's a sense of, 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 of well-being that I have to have and, and spiritual connection that I have to have just to be well with or without whatever kind of job I have. Mm -hmm. um, so I birthed Coweta Force, and originally it was called Coweta Recovery Community Organization. I got hooked up with this group. Um, the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse. I got hooked up with that group in 2013 and went through a certification course there. And it okay. was around peer recovery support services. Okay. And even though I, I was working in a counselor role at a treatment center, this was, this was actually living my, using my lived experience. Because when I'm in treatment as a counselor and I'm doing that work with, with patients or individuals that are in there as clients, yeah. it's not as a peer. It's, it, and even though that's painted my... It, it, that's paved the path for me to be in that position, I'm sitting at a desk. We never leave and go do anything together, mm -hmm. right? And I'm really excited about doing peer recovery because mm -hmm. it lets me do life with people, Yeah, yeah. you know? And I'm yeah. more excited about doing life with folks, you know? And so I got the certification, the 40-hour certification called the CARE certification. It stands for Certified Addiction Recovery Empowerment Specialist. And so about 60 people will apply for the certification. They'll call 30 in to do an interview and then they'll select 15 to 17 people to, go, to, to be selected into the group. And so it's a very narrow door that you walk through. And it's people that are out front, that are loud and proud about their recovery because a large, large part of this is, is the stigma. Mm -hmm. There's incredible shame. Yeah, that I goes along imagine. not only with the individual but with family members. Yeah. I mean, where do you go get help for stuff you can't go talk about? Sure, you know. So, and that was in 2013 mm -hmm. that you're going through that. And yep. so, did this organization evolve into Coweta Force, or Coweta Force is separate? So they're they're hooked up with a with a national movement called the Faces and Voices of Recovery. Okay. Now, the, the Faces and Voices Voices of Recovery was birthed, I think, in 2001. Don't mark, don't quote me on yeah. that. Okay. But it it is around communities being responsible for other members that need to find recovery. Yeah. Right? And so it's grass. It really is. It's how long do I sit around and wait for the government to fix our drug problem? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. How long do I, how long do I, do I, I've, how long do I try to function within a system that is somewhat fragmented and broken? Mm -hmm. Right? And as much we have to take ownership of that. Yeah, so when did you launch Coway to Fire? So we started out, to January 2016 was our first meeting ever. January 2016. January okay. 2016. So we came together and we, I really just invited you know, folks from the recovery community and all the, anybody in the community to come and be a part of this thing. And, the and did you start off at, I know you, you, at one point you met at Bridging the Gap. Is that where you started? Well, no. So the first thing that we did along with technical assistance from the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse was we we did a we hosted a recovery symposium a symposium is a fancy word for an event right. right and so really what we wanted to do we wanted to get all the stakeholders in our community at the table to talk about this thing called recovery not necessarily addiction we want to talk about recovery Right? And okay. what kind of resources we had. And really, this is more about us not operating in silos, but for us as a community to involve everybody that has a part in wellness and yeah. inviting them to the table. Okay. Right? And so that's what we did. We, we, did uh, we came together for our first meeting January 2016. We hosted our first symposium at um, Noonan. First United Methodist Church of Noonan, right, right here on right, the square. Right they, man, they were incredible. They were incredible. Um, Good folks over there. Oh man, I worked with Rachel Dennis, and oh, she yeah. she we got the parish hall for man. It was a great price. I mean, it really was. Yeah, it was a great price, and we had speakers and we had vendors, and everything was free. We we gave away T-shirts, and mm -hmm. so through the Georgia Council, they operate those symposiums on a grant. So they had five thousand dollars. That was our budget, five thousand dollars, and so we got 
we got everything pretty cheap. We got hooked up with Chick-fil-A and they donated sandwiches. And so we were actually able to spend the majority of that $5,000 on like on other food. We printed t-shirts. We gave out t-shirts. And so it was really around coming together to find out what our community. And that was in January 2016? We, we, had the, we had the symposium was in, was in May of 2016. May of 2016. Mm-hmm. So when did you start meeting on a weekly basis? Well, we met pretty regular around that, around that event. And then then we also did a in september we did a family fun event and i got a little bit burned out and i, and I backed way off mm. i backed way away from from it just because it was a lot it was a lot i was working full-time um and um with with kids and just life you know i ended up i ended up coming home from work and i would do more work and so doing nonprofit work is work people think sure. it's not work i mean it's sure. a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of work and i yeah. didn't really realize what all it entailed but it's a lot of work, um, mm-hmm. and so I backed off, and so I would come and I would go. But in in we started the all recovery meeting at Bridging the Gap in October of 2017. Seventeen. Yep. So we've just and, celebrated and it's a, our first and it's year. A, it's not twelve step. Nope. It's a. Can you walk us through what a, a normal night would look like? Well, so so we don't in, endorse nor oppose any pathway to recovery, and so essentially what the what the what the what I'm trying to do is because I, I do 12 step. Mm-hmm. I'm a 12 stepper, man. And, you know, you have all these 12 step fellowships, but how do we get people to come together outside of an anonymous program to make recovery more available? Got it. For individuals. And so all recovery neither enforces, endorses nor opposes a particular pathway to recovery. But what it does is that if you, we have three ladies that show up who lost their sons to overdose. Mm. And they can o- share in that meeting openly. So it's more of a creating a community. That's right. Of those who've been impacted by addiction. Yep. And or 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 community members that support the recovery lifestyle. Some people really haven't been that impacted by it, but are just interested in showing up and okay. supporting. Okay. And 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 all those folks are welcome. And they come, and you you have. I know that sometimes you have a meal, and you sit around in a circle. So and- we 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 put. We put tables together. We usually end up with about 30 chairs around tables. And so we come together and we eat and have coffee around 630, which gives a little bit of time to yeah. fellowship and ask questions and get to know folks. Yeah. And, and they're the regulars that come. And then there are new people that sort of wander in there and they're wondering, like, what is this? What's going on? And so we just try to make people feel comfortable and welcome. You can participate in the open discussion if you prefer. If you prefer to just sit back and observe, we are not going to make you do anything you don't want to do. Yeah. Right? Um, sure. Essentially, it, it is an open recovery meeting mm-hmm. for the community. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And so tell us, we, we don't have much time left, but I want to hear, can you tell us a story of someone's life who started coming to Coweta Force and how how the Coway to Force has impacted their lives. Well, well, I'll tell you. Just just the other part is that Coway to Force gets an opportunity to play a part in the bigger picture, right? We don't claim to be experts. We don't claim to be the end all be all. Mm-hmm. But I, I had a young lady um, who had her who had her kids taken from her custody. Three three boys, and her caseworker. Um, at the time was one of the original founding members of Coweta Recovery Community Organization, okay. now known as Coweta Force. Um, and she called me and she said, I got somebody that probably needs to come to that all recovery meeting. Would you mind just spending some time with her, having a conversation with her? Um, and she, uh, this was probably nine months ago. And so she started coming to the all recovery meeting and inter- you know, got introduced to recovery. Right, because I'm a 12 stepper, I was able to just talk about other other pathways to recovery. Right, I, I, I do I do an anonymous program. Bill Bill also attends. Bill Larkey attends, and he right. he goes to uh, celebrate recovery. And so, yeah. really, at the end of the day, we, we're it's kind of like going to Golden Corral, right? Like. What do you like? Yeah. What do you know you don't like? Okay, well, let's, let's explore the options of the things that you're open to. So at the end of the day, Coweta Force wants to serve as a, as a hub mm-hmm. of resources of, okay, um, wh- wh- what pathway do you want to choose? And what, what I know about recovery is bigger than not drinking and not taking a drug. It's about the way you're going to change your life. Mm-hmm. And so at the that's end of good. the day, it's, it's how, how can we get you hooked up with something that's going to challenge you to change the way you live, think, and believe? 
right? And so this young lady came to us probably about nine months ago, really, and she, every time she talked, she cried because mm. her boys were gone. Yeah. You know, she had compromised. You know, she loves her kids. Sure. Um, and and she, she had made decisions in, in her act of addiction that compromised the well-being or even just her having custody of her children. Yeah. And so they've been removed. And so she was pretty desperate. You take a mom that's lost their kids, oh, yeah. you know, they get pretty desperate yeah. on, on, on being open-minded to some yeah. new ideas. And so we just kind of just started walking through that process. And a lot of it was supporting that young lady. And she was going to uh, over to Celebrate Recovery at Sunrise. So she had those touch points with Bill and some of the other ministry leaders yeah. there. And so just more of that accountability and lifestyle, learn how to do that stuff. And um, she'd had this boyfriend, and he wasn't really sold on the idea of, of getting into recovery. And she made the hard choice to, to, to be by herself for the betterment of herself and her boys. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, which seems like an easy thing to do, but... You, no, that doesn't seem easy. I mean... You know, it just sounds... Yeah. It, I, it's very, it sounds very logical, you know? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I know that was a hard choice for her. No doubt. Um, no and doubt. she got hooked up with, with some other accountabilities, and she's doing well. She's, got, she's being reunited with her kids... Uh, for the past uh, two and a half months now, and she's 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 working full time. She's getting promotions at work. She's That's great. She's doing all the stuff, and she's continuing. You know, recovery. We don't get to graduate from recovery. You know, <laughs> that's good. We I don't I just don't graduate from it. It's yeah. like, what are the foundation steps, and how can I add to my foundation? Mm -hmm. It's not I get. You know, I get out of the trouble that I've gotten into as a result of my addiction. But the other thing is, how do I get how am I motivated to stay in the process? And so a lot of this is how can we as an organization help you figure out what you're passionate about, mm. right? And so we want to serve as a hub. The other thing is we're, we're offering peer recovery support services. So I'm hiring peers. I'm hiring people that are in long-term recovery. And what that means is a minimum requirement of two years sober. And they have to, they have to f go through an application process and go through that, that, that certification course. That, they turn into like a mentor. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty much like a mentor and really to help people explore their options, yeah. give you some accountability, help yeah. you explore your options that we have. We have a ton of really good resources in Coweta County all, already. My biggest thing is, is connecting those resources. There's no good. connective tissue, yeah. right? And so Bridging the Gap does stuff that I don't do. Right. Right. Sure. My church does stuff that I don't do. Your church does stuff that I don't do. And so right. letting people do the things they do well. And just connecting people to these resources. Yeah, you know, that's great. That is so good. So what? So somebody's listening today, Hank, and they say, you know, this is something I, I, I have an interest in recovery, or I need recovery, or I am in recovery, and I want to learn more. This is Calvary Force is something that I want to get plugged into. What's What's the best way for people to find Hank and to find Calvary Force? Okay, so we have prop, the, the the thing that's most active on the internet is going to be our Facebook page. Uh, you can go to Coweta Force and just like our Facebook page. It's got the full on schedule of what we do. Um, and you can go on our website, which is Coweta and uh, there's a section in there that if you want more information, you can just fill out your name, email address, phone number, and just sort of send me a quick message, and I, I'll reply usually within the hour. Um, and we also, you can come by and visit us. We just got a building uh, in the, at 8 Elm Street in Noonan, Georgia. So we are in the, the freestanding house behind First Christian Church at the corner of Elm Street and Jackson Street, right next to the old PAP Clinic and the University of West Georgia. And so we're rolling out a full-on schedule. Monday nights, we still have the all-recovery meeting, and we're doing it at Bridging the Gap, but everything else is at our new location. So okay. Tuesday mornings, we do a morning meditation recovery-related reading and a discussion from 8 to 9. Um, and then we, uh, on Friday mornings, is a, is a Narcotics Anonymous meeting from 8 to 9 a.m. Okay. And then starting next Monday from 8 to 9, we are having recovery through yoga. We have a certified yoga instructor that is going to, you know, she's paid to come in. She's also a person in recovery. She's been sober That's cool. almost six years. That's great. And so yoga and that sort of form of mindfulness was a huge part of her pathway to wellness. And so she's coming in, and she is amazing. She also is really into the art. She's a cert Not only is she a certified yoga instructor, she's a dance instructor, and she does a lot of things through the arts. And so she's a really cool young lady. Her name's Dara Wells. She also has this peer recovery certification course that she just went through about three months ago. 
Um, and so here, here she is able to be employed uh, and to earn a check and to earn some funds doing something she's passionate about. Yeah. And really, at the end of the day, I have people all the time ask me, what can I do to help? Really, what you can do is show up and talk about the things you love to do. Because if I'm hiring people, if they're volunteers, my one question to you is, what do you want to do? Yeah. What are you passionate about? Because when you get people that, that are involved in things that they love to do, they love to do it. They do it. That's great. And, and they, when they, and they show up. that God-given That's gifts right. they have. That's, That's right. And clearly, God is using you, Hank, and with your gifts, with your experience, there's no doubt that you are in your sweet zone right now, well, where God has, has you with mm -hmm. Coway to Force. And it's exciting. It's exciting to hear all that's happening. It's exciting to hear how God has brought you through your journey and where you are right now and impacting lives through Coway to Force. And I appreciate you coming in today for just, to, me. just for to share. Me. Yeah. Um, Quick, just go to um, Coyote of Force on Facebook mm -hmm. or Coyote of Force dot org, org mm -hmm. and you can learn more about Hank Arnold, the executive director and the ministry, um, the, the program they have at, at Coyote of Force. So, Hank, thanks so much, buddy, for dropping in. And, um, friends, thank you for turning in to, to FaithWorks this week. You have a wonderful Thanksgiving with your family. Take care and God bless. Thanks for tuning in to Faith Works with Pastor Jimmy Ellison from Noonan City Church. Tune back in here next week for another edition of Faith Works. taking a closer look at exactly